We will now proceed step by step and look at the different forms. We'll see what obstruction really is. We'll see how we can quantify obstruction, which importance it has. We will then take a look at other features in the echocardiogram and also on other pathologies which might mimic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And finally, we'll also discuss which therapeutic option we have and what role echo plays. First, I would like to discuss the non-obstructive types of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, in specific, the asymmetric hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is such an example. You can immediately see that the patient has significant hypertrophy, but that this hypertrophy is related mostly to the septum and not as much to the posterolateral wall, so it's asymmetric. Also note that there is no obstruction in the LVOT, so we do not have turbulent flow with color Doppler. There's only minor mitral regurgitation present. And we also have a normal motion of the mitral valve, so there is no SAM or systolic anterior motion. We'll talk about that phenomenon later. Another example, you can see that the septum is much thicker than the remaining portions. We can also see that the mid-septum is thick and not the basal portions of the septum. So this too is a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, an asymmetric type. Now let's take a look at the apical type of non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. First of all, it's a pathology which is more common or actually not so infrequent in the Asian population. It is characterized in the ECG by the so-called giant negative T waves. In general, it has a better prognosis than other forms of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And the typical echocardiographic finding is that of hypertrophy of the apex, where the ventricle has the shape of a spades. That's what we call the spade sign of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But again, note that we have significant left ventricular hypertrophy, which is more prominent the further we get to the apex. Sometimes it can be quite difficult to visualize this spade sign and the apical hypertrophy, especially in patients who have poor image quality and especially in patients where we have foreshortening of the apex. In this case, it is sometimes advisable to perform a contrast study, an LV contrast study, where you can nicely visualize the spade sign and the hypertrophy of the apical segments. Now I would like to take a look at the typical features of obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So in these 2D images, you can see the problem. What does the patient have? Well, first of all, he has massive left ventricular hypertrophy. Again, more of the septum than of the remaining portions. But this patient, in addition, also has a very abnormal motion of the mitral leaflet, in particular of the anterior mitral leaflet. And you can see that during systole, this leaflet is dragged towards the septum and thereby ob obstructs the LVOT. This motion is also called systolic anterior motion and it can be seen in several views, for example, the apical long axis view. Here, this is just a detailed view where you can see the obstruction by the anterior leaflet very nicely. But also in a short axis view, right here is the problem. And even in M mode, here during systole, we have a motion of the anterior leaflet which obstructs the LVOT. So this would be the LVOT here. Using color Doppler, we can visualize the obstruction. There is turbulent flow in the LVOT. There's even some mitral regurgitation. We'll talk about the importance of this form of mitral regurgitation later. And again here in the apical long axis view, turbulent flow, which begins at the region of obstruction by the mitral valve. So why do we actually have such a strange motion of the anterior leaflet? Well, there's a number of explanations. One is the so-called Venturi phenomena. In principle, we have a very narrow LVOT, so we have an elevated flow velocity within the LVOT, and this elevated velocity causes suction on the anterior leaflet caused by the Venturi phenomena, which is the reason why airplanes actually fly. Another reason could be that we have fairly long mitral valve leaflets in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and therefore these predisposed for obstruction. 
Another explanation is that the flow is often directed in such a way that we have a uh, bulging of the intertricle septum caused by hypertrophy and thereby the flow kind of comes behind the mitral leaflet and kind of presses the mitral valve leaflet towards the LVOT septum. And vortices also have been used as an explanation for this phenomenon. But whatever the reason is, the typical finding is obstruction of the LVOT caused by the mitral valve. Obstruction in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can even be seen with computed tomography. This is such an example where we have massive left ventricular hypertrophy of the septum and we have the mitral valve here during diastole. You can see how narrow the LVOT is. And during systole we have obstruction of the LVOT by the mitral valve and turbulent flow. Of course, CT is not the method of choice to diagnose uh, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You should actually be using echocardiography. We also find another typical sign in these patients. If we perform continuous wave Doppler of the LVOT, we can see an increased velocity. This reflects the gradients. You can even quantify the gradients with the help of the Bernoulli equation. But you also see a typical shape of the LVOT signal. The shape is that of a dagger. So remember, obstruction of the LVOT has a different signal than that of aortic stenosis. We have a dagger shape, which is typical for this pathology. Now that we've discussed the obstructive and the non-obstructive forms, I want to give you a demonstration and show you two typical patients. So let's take a look at a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and let's see how we can analyze such a patient and in uh, specific how we can differentiate obstructive from not obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. From the peristernal long axis view, it's quite apparent that there is massive left ventricular hypertrophy. But what is also is that the patient has very strongly speckled appearance of the interventricular septum. This is an atypical view just to cut through the myocardium and you can see that you have a lot of echo dense speckles here. This is caused by the fiber disarray. So this fits quite nicely to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, when we take a look at the mitral valve, we do not see any contact of the anterior leaflet with the septum during systole, so we do not see any SAM phenomena. And if we also put the color into the LVOT, there are no turbulences. So this again is against, uh, the, against the hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So Let's look at the apical views. Here in the apical view, let me just put some more of this on here. Again, let's look at the mitral valve. There is some degree of chordal SAM, but this is certainly not enough to cause obstruction. It doesn't even come close to the septum and it's only the cordia and not the valve itself so there is no obstruction here and if we look at the color we also don't see any obstruction in the LVOT or no turbulent flow in the LVOT by the way we also don't see any mitrogurgitation which is also something that we would see quite frequently if patients have SAM But to be 100% sure, you'd have to take a look with the continuous wave Doppler to see if you get elevated flow velocity in the LVOT. But this is a completely normal spectrum. First of all, the velocity is only 1.5 meters. And second of all, we do not have the typical shape of obstructive cardiomyopathy, the typical shape we see in dynamic obstruction. But to be completely sure that the patient does not have obstruction, we will also do provocation. So we'll put the continuous wave Doppler inside here again. And then I will ask the patient to press, nochmal pressen. See, the patient is now doing a Valsalva. 
the heart rate goes up, it shows that the Valsalva is effective, but the gradient does not increase. So we don't even have any gradients with provocation. In other words, this is a non-obstructive form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So let's look at the motion of the mitral valve in a patient with obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You can see that the septum is markedly thickened. The rest of the myocardium is as well, but definitely the septum is thicker than the rest of the myocardium. And if we look at the anterior leaflet, we can see that the anterior leaflet moves towards the septum and systole. We can also see that the endocardium is thickened in the region of the LVOT, which probably is due to the high turbulent jet, which causes some form of destruction or uh, impairment of the endothelium. And what we also see is that it is not only the anterior leaflet which mo moves towards the septum, but also the posterior leaflet. You can also see that there is a regurgitant orifice almost visible in 2D here at the mitral valve, and that this orifice probably directs the jet posteriorly. You can look at that in color, and truly you will see that the jet has a mo more posterior direction. In addition, we see turbulent flow in the LVOT, which is in contrast to patients with valvular aortic stenosis, where the turbulent jet starts here at the valve and not in the LVOT. So this is indicative of LVOT obstruction. We can also look at the SAM phenomena in a short axis view. This is the anterior leaflet here. This is the LVOT, and during systole, the anterior leaflet moves towards the septum, as well as the posterior leaflet. You see that especially in this region here. This is also visible with M mode. This is the M mode with the mitral valve in the opening position during diastole, the anterior leaflet here. And then we have systole here, and we see that there is, again, motion of the anterior leaflet towards the septum, which obstructs the LVOT. This is also visible if we put color. You can see that there is turbulent flow here during systole in the LVOT. Now we can also look at the SAM phenomena from an apical position. This is a five-chamber view. And we see the anterior leaflet, which is also thickened, which touches the interventricular septum during systole. Again, color shows this turbulent flow in the LVOT. And this is also visible in an apical long axis view. Obstruction right here, thickened septum turbulent flow, and of course, regurgitation caused by deformation of the mitral valve. So as you just saw, the morphology in color Doppler usually leads to the right diagnosis, but we also want to quantify the degree of obstruction. To do that, we look at the maximal velocity and then again convert these velocities to gradients with help of the Bernoulli equation. Usually we have velocities of somewhere in the range of maybe 1 to 1.4 uh, meters per second at most in the LVOT. In the setting of obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, those velocities can range sometimes even 6 meters. Remember, when we quantify the severity of LVOT obstruction, we only look at the maximum velocities and not at the mean velocities or the mean gradients. Gradients in the LVOT can vary greatly from one exam to the other because they're influenced by so many factors. You can also provocate gradients and increase the velocity in the LVOT by a number of different factors. These include the Valsalva maneuver, the application of nitroglycerin, this is actually also the reason why I should not uh, give patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy this medication, by exercise such as treadmill, but also by pharmacological stress such as dobutamine, and you will also note an increase in gradients post-exosystolic and you can provocate that for example during a cath study with the help of a pacemaker.
This following demonstration will show you how you can provocate a gradient in a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's also important to look at the gradients under provocation. We can perform a Vosalva maneuver or we can also give the patient nitroglycerin. The problem is that with the provocation maneuver, we usually change the heart axis. So this is the five chamber view. And you see we partially lose the image and that makes it very difficult to sometimes get those gradients. So you have to often perform this maneuver several times. And when you start out, try to get a very good image quality of the LVOT and then enter the continuous wave Doppler spectrum. And if you have the patient perform the Valsalva maneuver, we can get a very nice spectrum which shows the rise of the gradients under provocation. So this is at rest, then we let the patient perform the maneuver and we see that with an increase of heart rate, we also have an increase in the gradients to almost 6.5 meters. Remember, I promised we'll come back to mitral regurgitation in patients who have obstruction. Well, here is such a patient. We have a jet which is directed posterior into the left atrium, and this regurgitation is caused by the systolic anterior motion, in other words, by the distortion of the mitral valve in these patients. The reason we have regurgitation is the motion of the anterior leaflet, but also of the posterior leaflet. If the posterior leaflet is fairly short, it cannot follow the motion of the anterior leaflet, and thereby we get a co-optation defect and regurgitation. In addition, we also know that the severity of regurgitation correlates with the degree of obstruction. Here's an example to demonstrate this. Here we have a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy during baseline. We can see there's only mild mitral regurgitation. Then we perform a Valsalva maneuver. The patient increased his gradient, and at the same time, we also have an increase in mitral regurgitation to at least moderate, maybe even to moderate severe. Keep in mind that LVOT obstruction is not only confined to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but that it can also occur in other disease entities. For example, in hypertensive heart disease, in particular in those patients who have a sigmoidal septum or a very thick septum at the base, these patients can also develop a SAM phenomena and obstruction. Obstruction is also possible in patients following mitral valve repair. If, for example, the anterior leaflet was left too long, is a complication you have to be aware of. And it is also possible to see LVOT obstruction in aortic stenosis patients simply because they too often have significant left ventricular hypertrophy and can uh, develop SAM phenomena. This is such an example of a patient with aortic stenosis who also has hyperdynamic left ventricular function. You can see the, the SAM phenomena. And if we look at the continuous wave Doppler signal, we often have two signals within one. This is the signal of aortic stenosis, while this is the signal of the LVOT velocity. It is often very difficult to quantify aortic stenosis in the setting of LVOT obstruction, but we'll hear more about that when we talk about aortic stenosis. Here are some other causes of LVOT obstruction. First of all, patients following aortic valve replacement for aortic stenosis are at increased risk for several reasons. First of all, these patients have small ventricles, they have hypertrophy, so they have a predisposition for the SAM phenomena. And then in addition, they have acute reduction in afterload since they're operated and aortic stenosis is now gone. And then they develop LVOT obstruction. Other causes are hypovolemia and hypercontractile states, especially if predispos predisposing factors are present. Now let's turn to obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy of the midventricular type. It is the least common form. It is different from the LVOT obstruction in that the peak of the maximal velocity is later and that the gradients usually don't reach the same degree as those in obstruction of the LVOT. Here is such an example. You can nicely see that there is obstruction in the mid portion of the left ventricle, but there's also obstruction in the LVOT. So, there's a combination of both forms of obstruction in this patient, and this is seen quite frequently. 
combination of valve OT obstruction with midventricular obstruction. You can see the obstruction also with color Doppler, turbulent flow in the mid of the ventricle, and here we have the typical signal also. It's post wave Doppler and continuous wave Doppler. You can note an increased velocity in the mid portion of the ventricle. So in this case, we have the continuous wave Doppler signal right through the middle of the ventricle and not through the LVOT. Here's another patient, a three chamber view, where we have obstruction of the LVOT, sanfenonema, and also obstruction midventricular, as you can see here, by the turbulent flow in the mid of the ventricle, but also turbulent flow in the LVOT. Again, a combination of LVOT obstruction and midventricular obstruction. Another form of obstruction, or actually it's not obstruction, it's just a phenomena we see quite frequently, is the so-called apical squeeze. It is common in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and it is common also in hypercontractile states uh, and in left ventricular hypertrophy in general. It is hemodynamically insignificant and all you see is flow acceleration here way at the apex and turbulent flow. If you put a pulse wave Doppler signal here, you will see a flow acceleration, a minor flow acceleration, especially way at the end of systole. So there is no blood that is trapped in the apex here. This is just an apical squeeze. What else should you look for in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Always look at the septal thickness. It's important for the prognosis of the patient. A septal thickness above 30 increases the risk for sudden cardiac death. Look at the systolic function. Remember that small ventricles tend to contract hyperdynamic because they have to compensate for the small ventricle. Important, assess diastolic function because it correlates well with the symptoms again and it also shows the degree of left ventricular uh, elevation of the left ventricular filler pressure and the atrial size because patients who have enlarged left atria are at increased risk for atrial fibrillation and this is very detrimental in these patients since they rely very much on left atrial filling caused by atrial contraction. Here's an example of a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a very small ventricle who seems to have a normal left ventricular function but if you perform special analysis of contractile function to look at the longitudinal component we can see that longitudinal function is actually reduced in particular at the basal segments. This is a typical pattern for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So what are some of the problems that you might encounter in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? First of all you could have problems in differentiating hypertrophy from other causes. It could be a problem to differentiate the typical form of hypertrophy from the sigmoidal septum. And you could also have problems in the quantification of LVOT gradients because you might have interference with the MR signal. And finally, it could be difficult if additional aortic stenosis is present to determine what the severity of aortic stenosis truly is. What are potential other causes for hypertrophy? Athletes, hypertensive heart disease, aortic stenosis, as in this patient, and restrictive cardiomyopathy. Here are some examples. On the top you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. On the bottom you have amyloidosis. On the first glance these two echoes look almost the same. But note that we have LVOT obstruction here. We have more septal hypertrophy up here opposed to this patient where we have hypertrophy present as well but not as asymmetric as the example here on the top and we do not have LVOT obstruction. Here we have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Note that the septum is asymmetrically hypertrophied and here we have more concentric hypertrophy. This is the classic type of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and here we have hypertensive heart disease.